All right, so with everything we've learned up to this point sort of tucked away in our toolkit, what we're gonna do now is turn our attention towards quickly building another project that this time makes use of some more powerful features of Unity, uh, the physics engine in particular. So in this lesson, I'll introduce you to some basics of this underlying physics engine, which I think you'll find quite intuitive and rewarding to work with. Now, although the term itself, the term physics engine, it might sound daunting to those of us, myself included, who are unfamiliar with things like calculus or calculating forces and so on. Uh, in reality, it's something that ultimately simplifies the emulation of a multitude of complex interactions that you can have in a game world. Uh, this all requires not much greater understanding than basic common sense and sort of plugging in a few specific methods and properties that then handle the sort of heavy lifting uh, in the background, making the resulting calculations in the background. So you may be wondering then why didn't we start off with the Unity Physics Engine uh, to begin with, if in many ways it's a simpler approach than the roll your own solutions that we came up with in the first project. Well, I delayed looking at the Physics Engine for a few key reasons. One is that I want to start off with an approach that was as stripped down as possible. You know, just moving objects by their transforms and using simple handmade formulas of sorts to produce a dynamic world uh, that we can easily understand how it's working and predict how it will behave. By contrast, one of the sacrifices of using the, the physics engine is you lose some granularity of control. There's just a lot more hidden behind a sort of a black box, which in this case are all those hidden calculations you're handing over to Unity to figure out for you. And because of this, it's a bit harder to employ the physics engine to result in a very specific end result rendered on your screen and then also understand at a granular level how that's all occurring. So with emulating natural physics, there's just a lot more that goes into moving things than just artificially manipulating the transform. And understanding this interplay, I feel, is not very conducive to learning game design for beginners. But having become familiar with Unity through the previous lessons, you're more than ready to delve into this subject matter. And besides all that, the game that we'd made in the previous uh, lessons was a fairly linear sort of top-down game, and there were very few physics-type emulations that we had to come up with. There were, you know, a few collisions we need to emulate, for example, uh, when we sort of hit the boundaries of the game world or the enemy, and of course movement itself. But, as we saw, there wasn't really anything fancy needed to make our game world behave as we wanted it to. So the physics engine becomes a lot more useful when creating a more realistic world, where the interaction between objects are much more familiar to the ones that we see in our world. So that's why we'll be using the physics engine while creating a classic style 2D side-scrolling platformer. So being viewed from a sideways perspective, we now have a bunch of notions that we didn't have before, such as that of gravity, right? Including jumping and falling bodies with a sense of mass. We also have a notion of forces, sometimes opposing, you know, hitting, pushing, exploding, and so on. And we have collisions, you know, between enemies, walls, obstacles, and a slew of other things. Uh, as well, we also have the resulting force changes that might occur from all these different occurrences happening in the context of one another. So, with all that said, let's make a fresh start, start a new project, open up Unity and create a new 2D project called Physics 2D Side Scroller. Also create a new scene. So, we'll just say main scene. Alright, and as we did before, one of the first things we'll want to do is set up the main camera. So, just like before, we'll have It'll be a uh, 720p, so you want it to be an orthographic camera, which is basically a uh, 2D plane, or rather than the perspective, which is sort of uh, three-dimensional. And so for the size, it'll be 3.6, which is half of the uh, screen width in units. And uh, you get this actually by dividing the screen width in pixels, so that's 720, and uh, then divide that by 100, divide that by 2, and you get 3.6, half the screen width, right? So 
and that's representing units, right? So orthographic 3.6, and we'll put this resolution to the same one we had before. Um, if you didn't have this already there, just remember to make that 1280 and that 720 fixed resolution and create that preset. And we'll sort of recycle some of our assets from the previous project to make this new game. So we'll import our familiar Cheesehead Sprite, or actually a slightly updated version of it. And we'll set that to point. It's gonna be another pixelated sort of looking game. And we'll create a new game object. We'll call that Cheesehead. And we'll set its sprite render with the sprite, so add component. And may as well start creating some sorting layers here, some basic sorting layers. So go to sorting layer, add sorting layer. We'll create a background layer that we'll make use of probably later. And enemy layer and player layer and just so our default objects that we do not set to a layer we make sure it's in front of the background and of course we'll set this to the player layer and order it zero for now all right the two main differences between an ordinary game object that doesn't interact with the physics engine and one that can interact with the physics engine is basically just a couple of basic components. One is, it's called a rigid body component, which gives the game object some type of mass uh, in, in, to the physics engine, as well as a collider component, which does exactly what it says. It detects, it detects whether or not the collider intersects with another collider. So let's add these components to our cheesehead character, giving him some more corporeal qualities than he had before. So first off, go to add component. We'll say box collider and make sure to choose box collider 2D because um, this, this is the collider that's specifically used for a 2D game. And we'll set this to 0.5 and 0.5. And just to show you how I came up with that, if you go to your scene view here, I'll turn off that camera gizmo so you can see what's going on here. Where is that? Well, I guess I, I'm not sure how to do that, so I'll just instead move our cheese head a little bit. So yeah, in our scene view, it creates this green box collider. It's hard to see, but that's our collider. It's a little bit offset from our actual sprite, but you can uh, manipulate this to change the X value, the width of the collider, in other words, and the Y, so just gonna set this to 0.5 and 0.5. Whenever you make collider, it's often helpful to go to scene view and set it that way. And so for rigid body, we'll wanna add that too. So choose once again, rigid body 2D, not the, uh, the non 2D version. And we'll, we'll basically leave this as is for now. All right, so now our cheese head has a rigid body, so it has mass and it has a collider. So let's press play and see how this uh, affects our uh, cheese head character. There you see it falls and keeps falling because it doesn't collide with anything. But uh, otherwise it's responding to gravity, so that's a good start. Just to show you, if I uh, pause this while our cheese head's in free fall, if I remove the uh, rigid body component and unpause, it no longer is falling. So it has to have the rigid body component. That was only a temporary change while we're playing the game. So there's our rigid body once, once again. So what we're gonna need now is a collidable floor, basically. So let's create another collider. Uh, might as well add it to the camera here. It's the easiest way of doing this. So box collider 2D and once again, I can set this in the scene view. I want to make sort of a floor out of it. 
Right here, I'll use, I'll just use these settings that I found out before were optimal. Minus 3.55 for the Y offset. 17 point, say 83 and 0 0.15. There you go. So we got a little bit of a floor there. All right, I'm going to move the cheese head a little bit higher up. And now when we play the game, it should collide with the floor. And there we go. It, it no longer falls, keeps falling. It now has a collider. If we take out this box collider, then yeah, see, it just keeps falling. So now we have two colliders interacting with each other really easy. So now the rate of our cheesehead game object, the rate that it's falling right now is determined by the global gravity settings. So for that, go to edit project settings and in physics 2D, you'll see gravity here is defaulted to minus 9.81. So if I, so minus because it's basically creating a force downwards. So let's say, let's do something really dramatic. Let's say minus 500, let's see what happens there. So I'll press play. Oh, it looks like it just fell right through. Our cheese head game object just fell right through the collider. So uh, the physics engine just isn't basically uh, able to catch that intervening space where the colliders meet uh, because it's just moving too fast. So in order to fix this, we'll want to set the rigid body collision detection to continuous for the cheese head. So this just gives us a little bit of more precise collision detection. Oh, there you go, it falls like a stone. Now it actually stops at the collider. So I'm going to put the physics 2D settings back to the original, which was minus 9.81. We'll leave that for now. So also may as well set this to interpolate. Uh, this is basically to make sure that there's no jitteriness when the object is moving. You might start seeing that at some point if you don't have interpolate on. So it basically just smooths out the calculated motion by the physics engine. We typically control how the game objects interacts with the uh, physics engine, you know, gravity in the world, other rigid bodies, colliders, and so on, in code by accessing the rigid body component with our familiar get component. So let's create a script called uh, physics test and we'll attach it to the cheese head. So in physics test, I'm going to use a new kind of update method which again, we'll delve more into in the next lesson called fixed update. And in fixed update, what we're gonna to wanna to do is we'll get a reference to the rigid body component. So we'll call it cheese body, local reference in this fixed update method. And so we'll run get component, which will return rigid body 2D, that'll be the type. And now that we have a reference to that component, we'll say cheese body. You see all these different properties and methods available to rigid body 2D. Some of these you may notice from the component itself. Uh, first of all, we'll just access velocity, which should be pretty self explanatory. So cheese by velocity dot y which you imagine is, is what exactly is the, the uh, vertical velocity. Uh, we'll assign, actually we'll assign the entire velocity, which is a vector two and it's a struct. So we'll assign it a new vector two and one will be its constant velocity on the X. And, and for the Y, we'll just take in whatever the Y velocity happens to be. And we'll set the Y velocity here, which normally gravity takes care of, but 
we'll set a little case here. So if cheesebody.velocity.y is equivalent to zero, so if it's not moving vertically at all, in other words, on the ground more or less, we'll access the rigid body uh, and we'll use the add force method, which all, all this will become a lot more familiar in, in subsequent lessons. Uh, and we'll pass into that. It needs a vector two. So for add force, we'll say new vector two. And on the X, we won't give it any added force on the X axis. And we'll just give it an added force of 300 for the Y axis. So this will sort of push the object upwards, basically creating a jumping you know, an automated jumping mechanic. And so save that. All right, so I'll quickly play this so you see the result of that very simple bit of code. See, it's moving constantly on the X axis because of that one value we gave it. And then it's when it's reaching zero velocity, it bounces. All right. All right, so just a little bit of a primer on what you're looking at here. First and foremost, there's this new update method that we haven't seen before called fixed update. And that's because it's really particularly used for the physics engine, which we'll look at in the next lesson once again. But um, thankfully, this is the last update method that you'll really have to become familiarized with. Uh, I'll go into all, all of this in the next lesson, but for now, all you need to know is that fixed update runs exactly like update. It gets called at regular intervals, creating a loop-like state, just like update. The only difference between fixed update and update is that the intervals are not tied into the frame rate. They occur at fixed intervals of every 0.02 seconds. So whereas update runs every 0.016 seconds at 60 frames per second, and 0.032 seconds at 30 frames per second. Meanwhile, fixed update will always run every 0.02 seconds, regardless of the frame rate. So that's it, that's the only distinction between fixed update and update, but it's an important one. Now you might think this wouldn't produce consistent results, but it does. The fixed time step is actually necessary for the physics engine to follow a deterministic path, but Anyways, put that thought on hold until we come across it in the next lesson, but I just want to give you a quick little primer on it. So what we did here is we affected the velocity, which is a physics property via the uh, rigid body component. And notice we're not directly changing the transform, but rather determining the object's velocity relative to the global physics settings. And the result of that physics calculation itself then determines the object's transform position. That's kind of what I meant earlier when I said it's difficult to predict exactly where your, um, your game object that uses the physics engine ends up, right? You're kind of handing that all over to the physics engine. All right, so now what we want to do is add another physics object so our cheese head can interact with it. We'll sort of make a dummy game object. So actually we'll just call it dummy and we want to import the familiar eyeball enemy that we had from before. So put that to point and we'll want a sprite render. Put that on the enemy sorting layer. And so for the enemy here, what we'll do is we'll give it a circle collider 2D and of course a rigid body 2D, just like before. And I wanna put this particular spot in our scene so you can see the results of the interaction between our cheese head and the eyeball. So the uh, circle collider, change its radius here, I figured 0.21 is about right. And again, we'll leave the rigid body pretty much alone for now. Let's put the cheese head a little bit further back. Let's watch the cheese head interact with our eyeball now that they're both physics based. All right, well, 
they interacted, maybe not the way we were expecting them to. Uh, specifically, our cheese head now is bouncing on its head, so that's no good. That's easily fixed here. We just go to the constraints here for the rigid body for a cheese head, and we freeze the Z rotation, right? So he won't fall over with the Z rotation, basically being immune to the physics interactions. And here what we'll do with the dummy is show you another thing. There's this property here called is kinematic. So when we make the eyeball is kinematic, what happens? Well, no longer, it no longer interacts with the uh, physics engine, but it still has a collider. So that's why our cheese head still uh, interacts with it. So this is useful for some particular scenarios uh, when you need a rigid body, but you don't really want it applicable to the uh, physics engine. And another important thing for collision that you should be aware of is there's a global collision matrix where you can set what kind of colliders collide with other colliders. So for example, if we have a bunch of enemies with colliders, but you don't want them to collide with one another, but only with the player and the floor platforms and so on, you can do this in the global matrix. So for the global collision matrix, go to project settings, physics 2D, and there's our global collision matrix. Now we'll need to set up our own collision layers sort of like our sorting layers. So go here to the layer uh, on either game object and we'll add the layers that we need. So for example, we have a cheese head collision layer and we have an eyeball collision layer. And now all we do is just set cheese at the cheese head. We'll set our dummy to eyeball and now in our collision matrix there's our cheese and eyeball so right now eyeball an eyeball can collide with an eyeball as well as a cheese head so right now if we remove this this part where the cheese head and eyeball intersect they won't collide with each other anymore but they'll still remain colliding with other collidable elements All right So put that back on. Oh yeah, well, we'll talk a little bit about the rigid body that has some obvious, somewhat obvious properties here. For example, mass, so you can make it more massive. Uh, with the gravity scale, so how uh, it reacts to gravity, you might want to change the gravity scale for uh, your individual rigid bodies rather than globally if you want to fix certain elements such as the floatiness of the uh, of a particular rigid body. So if I make the gravity scale, well it's a little bit too large, let's say let's just say five, so five times the amount it will react to gravity. There you go, you see it just falls a lot quicker and now its bounces are also shorter. And another thing is the sleep mode for a uh, rigid body. And so with the sleep mode here, if we start a sleep, then basically when the game starts, the rigid body for this for the game object that it's attached to, it starts off not interacting with the physics engine. It only starts interacting with the physics engine when some other physics element interacts with it. So that's useful for that, but we'll be keeping it on start awake for our purposes. Okay, that's about it for getting our feet wet with the Unity Physics Engine. Hopefully this gave you some sense for how easy it is to make some cool things happen using the Physics Engine. Uh, I find that one of the most fun things uh, with using the Physics Engine is to press play and experiment with modifying values in the physics settings or in the inspector for your scripts with your exposed fields or your rigid body component, for example, and see how it changes the resulting interactions. Since when you press play, these changes are non-destructive. It's a really fun way to test things out in this sort of virtual playground type of sandbox. So uh, by all means, do that and test it out and have fun with that. But for now, uh, we'll leave all of what we learned aside 
and we'll learn more about how this works in code, particularly with how fixed update works in the next lesson.